Hey everybody, it's Saturday morning and I love jumping into my Saturday with the New Thought Media Network and spending 30, 40 minutes on the science of mind. Really taking time, whether I'm the one on camera or not, I am usually in the audience or here taking a few minutes to jump back into the science of mind. What did Ernest Holmes really write? And what does it mean? Some of you would remember when Arsenio Hall talked about or used the phrase or made the phrase popular, things that make you go, hmm. And I find that when I am reading the science of mind text, I often go, Hmm, what does that really mean? So I am happy today to be bringing forth some thought provoking questions and some exploration of the concept of faith. So my name is Tracy Brown and I'm based in Dallas and uh, I love that we are able to connect together across the miles, across the airwaves to explore this. So if this happens to be your first time watching Saturday of Mind, uh, uh, si Saturday Science of Mind, then just want to remind you that every week we are here at this time. There's a team of us and we rotate going through the Science of Mind textbook. So, wow, faith, chapter 10, beginning on page 155, captures so much. This is one of my favorite chapters in the book because when I first read it, mind blown, right? So I thought I knew what faith was, I would have said, you know, even growing up as a child that, you know, faith is right. You, you are able to um, look beyond appearances. You faith is about what you believe and what you believe in and living your life in accordance with that. So that is pretty, pretty logical and, and, you know, it makes sense. But when I read this chapter, there were some ahas that I hope to share with you today and remind you of when you got that same aha, whether it was through Ernest Holmes writing or through some other spiritual grounding that you found yourself deepening with. So let's dive in. So beginning on page 155 in the textbook, Ernest Holmes writes the very first sentence under the title, The Mental Approach. Ernest Holmes writes this, the universe is a spiritual system. Its laws are those of intelligence. We approach it through the mind, which enables us to know, will, and act. Prayer, faith, and belief are closely related mental attitudes. Now, they're not the same, prayer, faith, and belief, but they are closely related. When we are in prayer, we are demonstrating or um, acting based on faith. And the previous chapter was prayer. If you missed Reverend Z talking about prayer last week, you missed something. So I encourage you to go back and scroll through and find his conversation and his insights and his ahas uh, talking about Ernest Holmes' comments related to prayer. So prayer is one thing. Faith is, the, is also like a mental attitude, a mental attitude that is, as Ernest Holmes says, it's a mental attitude that you have so firmly ensconced yourself in your thinking in that you embody that mental attitude. And 
So, of course, that means that with faith, I can tell what you believe in and what you have faith in based on what you do. Because if you have true faith, it will be embodied in the words you speak and the action you take. And so prayer, faith, and belief are closely related mental attitudes. But we're going to focus on faith and how that shows up. So on page 156, I've had students in classes say this section on misplaced faith changed their whole trajectory and understanding about how real faith is. So why is this section called misplaced faith? Right in the middle of page 156, Ernest Holmes writes this, but what is fear? Nothing more nor less than the negative use of faith. Faith misplaced. I'm going to read that again because it is at the crux of us understanding what faith is and how to use it. Ernest Holmes writes, but what is fear? Nothing more nor less than the negative use of faith. Faith misplaced. Now that's a word right there. The way I often talk about this is some people will say, well, you know, I, I kind of have faith. Are, you know, my faith is about at 70% that that's going to happen. No, no, no. You can't have 70% faith or 5% faith. You can't have two thirds faith or, or any number of faith but 100%. You have 100%, 100% helping of faith. You are using at all times 100% faith. The question is, what do you have faith in? Where are you placing your faith? Fear is simply faith misplaced. If I am afraid that I am not going to have enough money to pay my bills, I am actually putting faith in the outcome that I will not be able to pay my bills. I am using the mental quality of faith, the mental attribute of faith, the mental practice of faith, and applying it to something that I do not want to have happen. What if I instead applied my faith to what I believe in and what I see or desire for myself? What if I did that? Fear is simply misplaced faith. Now, yes, let me give you a little bit of room there that there are things to be afraid of. If someone is approaching me, I often walk in my neighborhood. And if I am walking alone, as I often do, and maybe it's dark because I'm walking very early in the morning, or it's dusk and when I started walking, you know, it was light, but it's beginning to get darker. And, you know, I, I, it's starting, the sun's going down. And if I am walking and I'm five foot three, right? And someone is approaching me who is big, uh, you know, tall and big, and they're approaching me rapidly. Do I have a split second of fear? Do I have a minute of fear as I see them and I'm trying to assess my safety? 
that is a physical and a physiological reaction that is normal, that is designed for my safety to keep me aware of my surroundings. And I'm going to assess the danger and then act accordingly. I'm not talking about that when we're talking about the mental approach to faith. When I live in a constant mental activity of fear, I am demonstrating I have more faith in whatever it is I'm afraid will happen than I have faith in the good that can happen, that is available to me. So again, we're talking about in this entire section two, where we're talking about um, mental healing and spiritual mind treatment and all of these concepts that allow us to shape our lives using our mental capability and recognizing the power of thought and the purpose of mental healing of condition in that context we are talking about where am i spending my spiritual coin my mental coin how am i training my mind to think to guide me so if i am constantly living in fear that is where my faith is that is how i am uh, demonstrating my faith. So this little section that's only two paragraphs on page 156 is all about misplaced faith. And I love it. Ernest Holmes said, someone has said that the entire world is suffering from one big fear, the fear that God will not answer our prayers rubbish. I mean, naturally, it's probably true, but it's rubbish, right? How is it that God, spirit, the universe, universal mind, all knowing love, it can, it cannot not respond. So when we build that into our psyche, into our mindset, into our thinking, and then we behave as if, well, maybe God won't answer. Well, God says yes. Spirit says yes. So it's like, mm, I, you know, can't answer that because I've got to support this belief that my, that her prayers won't be answered. It sounds like a little counterintuitive, right? But it's true. If the universe is simply responding to the dominant thought, the thought we think all the time, the deepest desire from which comes great emotion and our deep belief, deep seated belief is that my prayers aren't going to be answered. Then even if it is answered, I don't see it. And that validates my belief and my thinking. So, one of the things I challenge you to think about is this, looking in your figurative mirror, what are you putting your faith in? If I gave you $101 bills, how many of those dollar bills would be placed on things you are afraid of versus what you want to happen? If you distributed your $101 bills where your faith is, would the majority, if not all, of your $101 bills be placed on things that are for your good. For most of us, we have, we would have way too many of those 
$1 bills on things I'm thinking about that I am afraid will happen that I don't want to happen, that I hope don't happen. Instead of investing our $1 bills on the power and the presence of spirit in my life, guiding me, directing me forward, making a way where there is no way, building the connections and, and having me directed to people and places and resources that then I'll put all the puzzle pieces together and deliver me the manifestation of what I most want in my heart's desire. Faith is a mental attitude. How are you applying it? So I'm going to move from there because even though this is a very short chapter, it has dozens of jewels like misplaced faith. Right after that, Ernest Holmes goes to understanding faith. And if you have an example that you want to put in the chat of how you understand faith to be, that would be great. And we'll be looking at some of those and pulling them forward. Or if you have a specific question about faith and you know, even what I just talked about, like, wait, you said it's mis fear is misplaced faith. Say more about that. You know, don't hesitate to use the chat because we'll be looking at it. Um, I do want to hear your comments and I do want to respond to your questions after we get a little bit further into the chapter. So understanding faith at the bottom of page 156 we wish a faith based on the knowledge that there is nothing to fear. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Many of us have heard that or read that in the Bible and in, and in other literature. The thought of faith molds the undifferentiated substance and brings into manifestation the thing which was fashioned in the mind. This is how faith brings our desires to pass. When we use our creative imagination in strong faith, it will create for us out of the one substance, whatever we have formed in thought. In this way, man becomes a co-creator with God. In this way, man becomes a co-creator with God. Does that make sense to you? Do you understand? There really is only one substance, right? There is only one mind. There is only one wisdom. There is only one life. There is only one thing that is all of life together. And so we get to differentiate our physical experiences and we are still a part of the one, the whole. So when we understand this, as Ernest Holmes writes, when we use our creative imagination and strong faith, it is what creates for us whatever we have formed in thought, whatever we are holding in our minds as our intention, as whatever we are using as first Cause, whatever we are clear about, this is the kind of life I want to have. If I believe that my life is miserable, I am creating more miserableness. <laughs> if I believe that everything that happens to me is good or leading to good, then I can deal with the fact that I have a medical diagnosis. I can deal with the fact that I don't feel well after my COVID-19 shot or vaccination. I can deal with the fact that my um, I fall when I'm skating and sprain my knee or my ankle. I can deal with all of that 
not because I assume it's good, but it's leading to good, right? I had a medical diagnosis early this year. Well, okay, I didn't really have a diagnosis. I had a mild abnormality, to use my doctor's words, from a lab test. And there's a part of me that's like, oh, well, that's not good. But it's leading to good. How did it lead to good? It led to good because that mild abnormality required some additional tests. But it also woke me up at an early stage in what maybe a year or two from now could have been a major problem and maybe even life threatening. So it woke me up and I, and I began to think, oh, well, you know, through the pandemic, I used to roller skate at least twice a week before the pandemic. For several years, I took Zumba classes, dance exercise classes, and it was not unusual for me to go two or three times a week. And when I wasn't doing that, especially in the spring and the fall, I would walk in my neighborhood two to four miles, a couple times a week, sometimes four or five times a week. So I was much more physically active. And we all know the pandemic, you know, work from home, shelter at home, physical distancing changed all of that. Could I have still been walking at least on a regular basis and for longer times? Absolutely. But did I? No. So the mildly abnormal lab test actually made me go, wait a minute, I have to take care of my body. I know how to take care of my body. And oh, by the way, I eat generally well. But being less active and being home all the time for over a year, I had gone back to some old habits of buying things that were comfort food, eating things that I had not been eating for several years, but, you know, I, they got back into my food plan somehow. So the leading to good was that over the last two months, oh my goodness, I've been more conscious and more aware, and I've been affirming my health. Every cell in my body knows how to work with every other cell in my body to generate wholeness, right? Oh, I have the providers and the access to care that lowers my blood pressure and that allows me to uh, have um, a pain-free, have a shoulder that works, without any pain, right? I, I know how to use affirmations, so do you. Shifting over my mind, and as Ernest Holmes talks about in the definition of faith, you know what you have faith in because you embody that thought. So in the last week or two, I've noticed that, yeah, what happens in my brain if I haven't been roller skating or if I haven't walked and it's been two days, you know, 48 hours, my brain starts triggering me. When's the last time you walked? Oh, you need to walk because I now have faith in my ability to impact my health. And I always had it, but I wasn't actively engaged in it. I am using my faith in a good outcome. I can contribute to my health being the best it can be versus I put in, instead of putting faith in, oh my goodness, I'm getting older and I'm getting sick. Oh, oh, I'm getting older and my body is falling apart. Oh, you know, I have a, a family member who has this, disease or who has experienced this medical process. And I bet that's going to happen to me. I could put my faith there so easily. 
easily easily there's a part of my brain that reminds me often that my father had four heart attacks before the age of 50. i could put my faith in the fact that even though i'm over 50 that is where my body that's what's going to happen in my body as well so like you i have to stop and remember and recall the truth and that there is my own experience that I can influence by what I think. And as it talks about in this chapter, by understanding what faith is, how I can use it and asking myself always, where am I placing my faith? I cannot be confused. I cannot allow both ideas to live in my mind at the same time. Does that resonate with any of you? Do you have times when you realize you are putting your faith in something you don't want and it's creating confusion in your mind? Confusion is the next place that Ernest Holmes goes in this chapter. He talks in this, in this sub section of the chapter about no confusion and um, on page 158 he says prayer wherever prayer in faith touches reality praise a right praise according to whatever the truth is then the prayer must be answered so the prayer must be answered when we believe and we combine prayer and faith and belief all in the same direction at the same time. What many of us do, and I even catch myself doing it sometimes, I pray for one thing. My faith is placed somewhere else on something that is not the same as what I pray about. And my belief is in the negative outcome. I pray for great health. My faith is in I'm getting older and my health is not going to be so good. And my belief is that I'm impacted by my father's genetic and physical experience. And that's going to happen to me too. And what does that do in my mind? It's three competing ideas. Although the faith and the belief are kind of similar. Because of what happened to my dad, I'm getting older. Oh my goodness. I'm going to have that or something similar happen. So of the three, two of the three are misplaced faith, right? Are focused on what I don't want. And my prayer is focused on what I want, but it's getting this pushback that creates confusion in the mental process. And what our goal is, is to have our prayer, our faith, and our belief all be on the same stream so that is our opportunity and when we truly understand faith that is a place at least for me where there is so much power so much grounding and so much opportunity and here's um, what just went through my mind is that while belief is super, super, super important, it still is invisible until it shows up in our actions. And often our belief drives our unconscious behavior, right? But our faith, while it's invisible too, until it shows up in our action, it feels more tangible in terms of conscious thought. 
belief often is reflected in our unconscious thought and, and things we're not really thinking about. Our faith really is reflected in our conscious thought, right? Our self-talk our the thoughts that really come to our mind when we're driving you know and we're just reflecting on our day or at the end of the day when we're reviewing the day our faith shows up in our actions in tangible ways that we can consciously grab onto and so for me i am constantly encouraging myself and others to before you do spiritual mind treatment, get really clear about what is the purpose of that treatment. What is it that you have faith in that you will deliver or that will be delivered and orchestrated in your life? More often than not, we see our faith attached to that which we don't want. And just last week, I was working with a client in a practitioner client session. And she said to me, I get that. I get that faith is important. I like the word trust better because faith just seems so, you know, ephemeral. So uh, like out there, and I want to be able to trust in God, which is a much more human, uh, feels more tangible thing for many people. And we got into this conversation about, I, about do you really believe that your faith makes things available? Like, all the good of the universe truly is available to you. Many of us quote Ernest Holmes saying there's a power for good in the universe. It's available to all and you can use it. Are you using it in terms of faith? On page 158, Ernest Holmes writes as he begins the section that it is available to all. He begins that section with this. Persons familiar with biblical history hardly need a lesson about faith for the 11th chapter of Hebrews is full of instances proving faith's sustaining power. And then he goes on to refer to, you know, all of the, the stories in that chapter and the people who are referred to who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed mighty in power, turned to flight armies of alien to fight armies of aliens or to flee or flight Armies of aliens, women received their dead raised to life again. Faith. It's available to you whether you your net worth is $3 million or your net worth is $3. Faith is available to every one of us simply because we have been created from the allness and the wholeness and all of the qualities that are the nature of God are our true essential nature. Faith in that truth, faith in knowing that you are that, that you are the I am that I am will guide you through whatever challenge, whatever trial, whatever tribulation. And these are not just pretty words. It is the truth when your faith is so deep in a positive outcome or in knowing that your life is, uh, is a life being lived on purpose and in purpose, it is faith that allows you to stand through the trial. It is faith 
that allows you to walk the uh, what feels like in the maze of life where you keep getting hitting dead ends. It is your faith. It is not magic. It is your faith in knowing who you are. So Ernest Holmes writes, since faith is a quality unconfined to age or station, it may be ours today as much as it has been any person's at any time. We are not going through a harder time today, a longer or darker night than has ever been experienced before. It only seems darker because we have lost faith. The beacon light. Faith is the beacon light that pulls us or guides us forward. Or sometimes faith is behind us, pushing us forward, right? So for me, an example of that, and I'd love to have your example, if you have one, of how you recognize that faith is the same. The faith that I am living on today is the same faith of David or the of David and Goliath. Uh, it's the same faith of Jesus. It's the same faith of Martin Luther King Jr. It's the same faith. It's not a better faith or a weaker faith or a stronger faith. Faith is faith. And being able to walk through. So last year, in the past year, when, you know, every person on the planet was saying, oh, we are living in unprecedented times. Okay, so life is constantly expressing, expanding, and evolving. And maybe there have not been the exact combination uh, or sequence of events that happened in 2020 and leading into 2021. But the faith required to navigate it is the same. So you are looking at me and it may uh, be noticeable to you that I am a black woman and I don't deny that racism exists in the world and I am not in complete control over other people's behavior. So when people judge me or exclude me or treat me based on their perception of me based on the color of my skin. And that turns out to be something that is negative from their perspective. They think I am less than they believe I don't have the same rights to live the way they live, etc. I don't have any control over what they think, how they behave or what they say to me. And my faith in being able to not just survive mistreatment, not just handle whatever is thrown at me, is based on my faith that I am here for purpose, that God doesn't make mistakes, the fact that I'm a Black woman, that there are so many positive things about that, and I am not in control of what this other person does. I am not in control of the political environment that I live in. I am responsible for how I respond to it. I am responsible for what I do to change it, to influence how it can be different for my neighbor or for the next generation. I'm responsible for that. But whatever I choose, I am choosing from a place of faith that I live in a world where people are treated fairly and equitably. My faith in the, the belief that God created a world where there are different kinds of people on purpose. And our job is to find a way to live with people who are different from us in harmony and love. My faith is what navigates me through whatever is thrown at me. My faith does not control anyone else. 
but my faith having me and guiding me to live in that way and to respond to racism in that way is deeply embedded in spiritual principle. And it is the same spiritual principle that guided generations of people who were black before me to be able to navigate Jim Crow laws, to be able to navigate being um, challenged by uh, living a life where they were enslaved. It is the same faith that allowed people who were black, who were stolen from Africa or sold from Africa into slavery, never to see their homeland again. They were people of strong faith, knowing that no matter what is happening, I, am an expression of the one who created me. And that is enough to get me through this and to guide me to help someone else. Does that make sense? So your experience may not be racism. Your experience may not be related to any um, genetic or cultural identity group. Your challenge or it's something that it that requires deep, deep faith in your life may be related to money or may be related to your career. The, the issue or the challenge is to recognize where am I placing my faith? Am I placing it in fear? Am I placing it in blaming other people and not taking responsibility for my own beliefs and my own authority in my own life? Or am I settling for being a victim and misplacing my faith? So lots to think about when we talk about faith. And um, it's a very short chapter, but it's a really powerful one. And we're about halfway through it. So I'm scanning just to see if there are any questions or if there are any examples in the comments that um, that we want to highlight because it is really powerful for us to consciously and intentionally engage in faith. And in the second half of this chapter, Ernest Holmes reminds us of that in several ways. I love that Wayne says, Ah, that Rory says, because there are no distractions or interferences like fear or prejudice, children exercise faith easier, right? They have faith in good. They have faith in joy. They have faith that no matter what's happening, they're going to move forward. And so I love this example, Rory, of being healed by a medicine man when you were a child and that you believed in his power so much that all he had to do was touch me. People who've read the Bible know the story of the woman who all she had to do was touch the hem of, of, of Jesus's garment, right? Because her belief and her faith was, all I, if I could just touch him, if I could just be that close, then this is gonna be all right, right? So this is a powerful example, a powerful example. And Wayne also reminds us that, yes, we get what we program into our mind. And so we control the mechanism because we control the programming. I love that framing. I love that phrase, phrasing. It's like so many of us in this day and age think about what it takes to program the computer to do certain things. And that's what we're doing in our mind, our brain physiologically, but our mental and emotional state is our mind that is also driving the output and our faith is absolutely that. So Ernest Holmes goes on to talk about 
vitalizing faith. And at the bottom of page 159, one of the things I have highlighted like four or five times, because it's in different colors, we shall often need to know that the truth which we announce is superior to the condition we are to change. The truth we claim, the truth we have faith in is superior to the condition that we want to change or move away from. And in uh, the next paragraph, Ernest Holmes writes, one cannot be a good student of the science of mind who is filled with fear and confusion. We must keep ourselves in the state of equilibrium in other words, in a state of spiritual understanding, which is a belief in goodness must be greater than any apparent manifestation of the opposite of goodness. If you could just remember that, I want to keep my focus on the spiritual understanding. I want to keep my belief in goodness greater than my belief and my faith in anything that appears to be the opposite of good. If we could just do that, we would be walking in faith constantly. Now we're winding down and I, I know that um, there are two or three quotes in here that are super powerful and I've saved them for last because of that, because I want you to be thinking about them after this time together ends. So on the last page of this chapter, on page 162, Ernest Holmes drops the mic, drops the mic. Second paragraph, second full paragraph on page 162. Because we fail to realize that principle is not bound by precedent, we limit our faith to that which has already been accomplished and therefore few miracles result. Like it just shuts my mouth every time. I truly drop the mic. Principle is not bound by precedent. Principle is not bound by precedent. Say it with me. Principle is not bound by precedent. One more time. Principle is not bound by precedent. Principle with a capital P, spirit, law, the way it is, God is not bound by, is not limited by, is not put in a box based on precedent, whatever happened before. My dad had four heart attacks before the age of 50. That happened. It's precedent. But my God is not limited to making that happen for me unless I believe in it or unless I claim it or unless I have faith that that is what is going to happen. Now, luckily I'm past the age of 50, but you don't know how many times in my thirties and forties, I had to work with that precedent and disconnect myself from it and say, this is not my life. That was his life. And he learned some great things from that and went on to live another 27 years. Right. I had to reframe the story. But what got me doing that was the reminder principle is not bound by precedent. So if you are putting faith into what has happened before to you or to your family or to anyone in the public eye and you are putting your faith in that is the best that God can do for you, then I invite you to up your faith, increase your faith in good. You went uh, and you filed bankruptcy 15 years ago and you're afraid it's going to happen again. That's misplaced faith. 
Instead, shift your story and put your faith in. Yeah, that was an experience I had, but spirit has way more in store for me. I am not only wealthy, I am a philanthropist and I am able to um, help teach others financial ways, ways to manage their finances so that they don't experience what you experienced. Principle is not bound by precedent. And last but not least, the first sentence of the last paragraph in this chapter on faith. If we are to have an active faith, the faith of God, instead of merely a faith in God, our thought must be centered in universal mind. We are convinced that under divine law, all things are possible if we only believe and work in conformity with the principles of the law. Such a faith does not spring full, for, full orbed into being, but grows by knowledge and experience, and I would add by practice. We must have the faith of God, not just a faith in God. Faith as a spiritual quality is belief and behavior that reflects a knowing and an understanding that I have access to all the good of the universe. The universe is here to serve me and I co-create with God my experience, my evolution, and my transformation. That is the faith of God. <coughs> Excuse me not faith in God as some external source that is going to swoop down and with a magic cape and save you. The faith of God recognizes that spiritual law is always working and you know how to use it. The faith of God is that the wisdom, the infinite intelligence, the all-knowingness is operating in divine order in my own life. And so I have complete faith that good is what I am to experience. This is the kind of faith that is referred to in this chapter of the science of mind. My name is Tracy Brown. I am so delighted to spend this time with you diving into the science of mind, a faith, a philosophy, and a way of life. I hope you will join the, our team every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Mountain Time to go through the science of mind book and to talk about the science of mind principles that guide us all in living a life that is amazing, joyful, and perfect in every way. Take this into the week with you. <laughs> Bye for now.